the Ortho PAC hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Today, I'd like to welcome Eric Chapman, physical therapist. Eric, I was hoping we could start, if you don't mind telling us a little bit about yourself, where you went to school, certifications you have, and maybe what led you to physical therapy. So I've been a physical therapist for quite some time. I'm a West Virginia University graduate of 1994. After that, became McKinsey certified uh, for treatment of lumbar spine and, and cervical spine and thoracic spine conditions. And then in 2016, went back to school, got my master's in healthcare administration degree from Ohio University. I appreciate you being on the show. I wanted to have you on today to talk a little bit about the role of a physical therapist in an orthopedic practice. Yeah, I think it's expanded quite a bit. I think the vast majority of healthcare has moved towards the outpatient setting in general. So most uh, care these days is is moving away from an inpatient setting and even a home health care setting. So we are probably a more expanding section of health care, and our therapists have become more successful and more highly trained. They've, just like the PAs, have become a little bit more subspecialized in, in specific care of specific conditions. So we've seen a highly trained group of therapists that now become more subspecialized in treatment of only one condition. And so having a pretty eclectic and well-rounded group is pretty important for my practice. And it's certainly something that we've seen as not only an opportunity to grow, uh, but also an opportunity to serve patients with a variety of conditions. Oh, yeah. You know, physical therapists are an integral part of any orthopedic practice because it's such a big component to recovery from the surgery or injuries. And what I wanted to do today was hopefully touch on some basics for our listeners and to make sure they're aware there are many types of treatments that are available uh, when you're ordering physical therapy. I wrote a little manual uh, a while ago, and I talked to several of our physical therapists about what to put in it. And one of the main things everybody said is when you order PT, say evaluate and treat. I know some surgeons have protocols they want you to follow, but if you're overly specific, what kind of issues can you get into? I think there's a lot of variables that really influence our decision making on frequency of care. Mm -hmm. Some of those are absolutely medical variables healing properties of tissue time and that timeline. And that really goes to some of the surgical protocols that outline active assistive motion during these timelines, active motion during these timelines, strengthening, and those type of variables. And then, honestly, there are some really significant social considerations and social variables that influence the ability of the patient to attend therapy, whether or not that's transportation, co-pays, benefit limitations, all those variables really influence what a patient has available from an insurance package, but also uh, whether or not we can, we can be successful with care. So I think in general, it's always really important to write that evaluate and treat without a lot of influence on timelines and specifics. That way, when my patient does present with an $85 copay or a $60 copay, you know, the reality is, is that most patients with that expensive of a copay are not going to be able to see you two or three times a week uh, for six weeks. It just adds up too quickly. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a big thing. What should be a a general guideline for how many conditions or how many body parts that we order at one time? You know, why don't you work on their neck, back, both shoulders and both knees in one hour? I know how much you like to get that kind of referral. Funny enough, I actually don't mind that order. I think it's important for the APP to uh, screen the patient, make sure that they are identifying the problems that the patient's most concerned about, as well as the therapist's ability to kind of nail down and focus on the most critical component for the patient at the time. There are a number of those conditions that can be treated together. So, for example, 
shoulder and cervical spine typically roll together pretty well. Anyway, we should be looking at cervical and thoracic mobility for our sh shoulder patients, and as well as just general uh, core and, and stability functions. Bilateral or extremities and a spine, lumbar spine, tend to go pretty well together. We tend to kind of roll that care together. Most times when you get an order like that, the patient will present with a more pressing condition that tends to be the starting point in the focus of care. And then you can kind of roll in the other pieces of the patient's order or prescription. Well, we had some discussions early on when we were going over, you know, what we would talk about. And one of the things that we discussed was that physical therapy is actually moving away from the use of modalities, which is different than it was when I came along. The modalities being things like e-stem and cold therapy. Is there a role for certain modalities, you know, dry needling or uh, K-tape, or are we moving completely toward a functional-based treatment protocol? I think a little bit of both. The ability for the patient to order a TENS unit on Amazon or a cold pack or a heat pack, that tool is still an appropriate tool. The issue is not that it's an appropriate or inappropriate tool. It's just from a practicality perspective, if a patient's going to receive a, a six or $700 bill from their insurance carrier for a device that they can order Amazon for $40, then they should be using the resources that way. So I think part of what we're trying to do is not only move towards a more functional approach, but also be a, a good steward of the healthcare dollar by allowing the patient to use tools like that on their own rather than build their insurance carrier for, for that service. But as far as dry needling, kinesio tape, or the other taping methods, instrument-assisted soft tissue work, all of those are really appropriate tools for a certain group of patients, but they are tools that you use to ultimately achieve good motor control and strengthening soft tissue mobility, those type of functions for the patient. So even dry needling, K-tape, and the instrument-assisted work is still kind of geared towards a functional-based uh, solution for a patient. Mm -hmm. So other things that PTs typically do in outpatient orthopedic practice, I mean, two things that came to my mind were work conditioning and functional capacity evaluations, FCEs. Can you speak to those a little bit? The workers' comp patient population is certainly one that we see quite a bit and it's patient population that has a different subset of rules for us as far as, uh, you know, even referrals. So for a workers' comp patient, we do want you to be specific on frequency and duration because we need that for an authorization perspective. And so, you know, once a patient has kind of completed their physical therapy, their next phase is that transition to a work conditioning. And I think it's important to kind of define the difference between work conditioning versus work hardening. Work conditioning is, is more of that overall endurance-based care. It's usually two to four hours worth of pseudo and work performance activities as well as general conditioning to get the patient functionally back to an endurance level that they can tolerate their normal day-to-day -day work. It's typically cardio equipment as well as some level of work stimulation. Work hardening is typically a more interdisciplinary approach. So you have a therapist, a voc rehab counselor, a psychologist, and a physician all working together for about eight hours a day for that patient to kind of return them to work. Typically, and for for the vast majority of your listeners, you're probably gearing um, most everything towards a work conditioning. Mm -hmm. And then after they uh, maximize their work conditioning, then you go on to the functional capacity evaluation. And the functional capacity evaluation is more of a direct task-specific analysis, whether or not somebody can lift, how much can they lift, was it from the floor to height of waist or waist to overhead, and really breaking down the specific task, testing them, retesting them, determining a level of reliability and validity of the exam, and then presenting those results back to the referring physician so that they can either determine safety for the patient to return to work or whether or not 
they're at maximum medical improvement and or rate them. So those are all part of that decision-making tree for for returning a patient to work and or uh, providing them with a uh, a rating. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, I worked with a surgeon that did a lot of uh, workers' comp evaluations. So if you are in practice and you are working with someone that sees a lot of comp patients, get used to those terms, the FCEs, work conditioning, MMI, PPI, all important things to know. In our practice, I know therapists do a whole lot more than we've talked about. Uh, in our practice, the PTs really don't do wound care or say a high level neurologic deficit or things like that, but they do a lot of these things. And, and you got to keep in mind, it's not just working on range of motion and strength. There's a lot that goes into the physical therapy. Eric, for the sake of time, I wanted to ask you one more thing, and this is kind of front and center on everybody's radar, really, but telemedicine and physical therapy. Can you talk a little bit about that, uh, how it's gone for the pandemic times, you know, insurance, and how do you see that going forward in the future? So I think COVID really exposed um, the opportunity for telemedicine and really also exposed the patient's desire to seek care in a, in a safe fashion. My group was using telemedicine prior to COVID. And so we've been beta testing it with our surgical patients for the past couple, almost 18 months to two years. The role of a PT right now in telemedicine is really strictly related to the COVID pandemic and health and human services directors definition of pandemic and who is allowed to treat patients with telemedicine. So there's a lot of advocacy work going on right now to ensure that PDs and OTs and speech therapists maintain the ability to see patients after the pandemic ends for telemedicine. But it is it is absolutely a tool that we can use to effectively treat underserved patient populations and underserved communities, as well as patients that are highly susceptible to COVID but still require care. And so initially we use telemedicine, much like probably a lot of your listening community, as a stopgap measure and a method to maintain care for patients who are actively being treated but could not come into the clinic because of shutdown. The ability to, to continue this um, and is, is critically important. And there's a lot of patients that either can't afford the time off work and so being able to prevent them from driving 45 minutes to therapy, parking, going to a 45 minute to an hour appointment, then driving back to work. They can't take off a half day to go to a therapy appointment. If they can squeeze that in in a 45 minute to an hour window and still be effective, I, I think it's critically important that we continue to push this topic as, as far as a uh, national legislation to make sure that we maintain the ability. And I think that's where we see the opportunity to uh, not only reach patients who are either geographically underserved, but also other patients that are underserved, as well as patients that require significant healing and you don't want to use up all of their therapy. And so, you know, you use different software platforms uh, to uh, encourage patient engagement. Um, so we're currently using an app called Get My Care Plan, and that is a tool that we use for our total hips, our total knees, and our unicompartmental surgeries so that we can continue their treatment plan over a longer period of time, but maybe use less therapy or spread out their therapy over a longer period of time so that we can restore them to a, a full capacity. All right. Eric, I really appreciate your time today. If our listeners have any other questions or uh, want to have uh, do some more reading on physical therapy, do you have any recommendations for resources, books, websites, that sort of thing? Yeah, I think the easiest answer to that is uh, the American Physical Therapy Association website is very versed in the different subspecialties of therapy as well as uh, a good resource and a tool uh, for patient education, as well as provider education. I think one of the things that I've found most critically important is being able to have that really good interaction with my referring provider. I know I've gained a tremendous amount of knowledge from working 
directly with you and and the other APPs in my practice as a collective uh, way to kind of steer a patient in, in the recovery and restoring them to to good function. But I think from a reading perspective, the American Physical Therapy Association website is a is a really good resource. Perfect. Eric, thanks a lot for taking time out of your schedule and talking with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining the OrthoPAC podcast. We also welcome you to visit our website, paos.org, where members can download virtual conference content and get Category 1 CME. That's the paos.org Learning Center. Also, if you're a non-member, please visit the aapa.org Learning Central for the PAOS virtual content.